This program is brought to you by Emory University. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm glad everything worked out this morning with the weather, and we are open. Um, we are uh, very honored today to have with us uh, Dr. Nishimura uh, from Mayo Clinic. Uh, he's a professor of medicine and cardiology in the Mayo Clinic College of uh, Medicine. Um, he's an expert on hemodynamics. His interests are uh, pericardial disease, who he will talk about today, valvular heart disease, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. He's the master uh, of the American College of Cardiology and the master of American College of Physicians, basically a master of masters. Uh, he's the chair of the SEC and AHA Valve uh, Heart Disease Guidelines Committee. He has multiple educator awards received from uh, many committees and, and national and international committees, as well as the Mayo Clinic. And they say they took him out of the voting. Uh, his name took out of the voting because he has taken more than 20 uh, educator awards through the years. He's also the director for the cardiology board review in Mayo Clinic, which I highly recommend. And uh, I know all the fellows uh, see it on the tapes. And uh, also he's a great and very dynamic speaker. Speaker, So we are very happy to have him today to talk to us about pericardial disease, a new look at an old disease. Dr. Nishimura, welcome. Well, thanks very much. Um, I see the city's closed, and I come from, I, it was about 20 below when I left with a 40 below wind chill, so um, that's the comparison here. Anyway, I, what, what I thought I would do is, is talk about an old disease, um, which is these are the pericardium. And if you think about it, it should be a pretty simple problem because there's only three things that can happen with the pericardium. Uh, number one, it can get inflamed. Number two, you can get fluid around it. Number three, it can get constricted. And if you make the diagnosis, the treatment is easy. You reduce the inflammation if it's inflamed. You remove the fluid if it's causing a problem. And you remove the pericardium if it's constricted. But, and, and Spencer knows, because he's written for the ABIM before, um, even though it's a simple problem, it's, it, it is probably the most misdiagnosed and undertreated um, problem in cardiovascular diseases today. When the board kind of goes through all of its questions to figure out uh, where people have gaps and deficiency, it's adult congenital heart disease and pericardial disease, as well as then vascular disease, which comes after that, which causes the major problem. So wh what I think we should do today is three things. Number one is kind of an update in treatment of acute pericarditis. People think they know how to treat it, but um, quite honestly, it's mistreated uh, across the country. Uh, number two is uh, talk a little bit about pericardial effusion, kind of some of the subtleties on when to tap. And then finally, the hemodynamic challenge that we all have now with patients who come in with the diagnosed contrictive pericarditis. So it's, it's going to be a simple but practical approach to taking care of your patients with pericardial disease. And I think I'll start out with this pretty common case right here. Um, and, and first of all, where, where's your fellows? Are they in the audience? Actually, they're near the front, though. That's unusual for uh, Grand Rouse. Okay, so um, who's your smartest fellow, Reverend? <laughs> okay, we'll just have somebody yell out then. So you got a 24-year-old young guy, uh, presents with two days of severe pleuritic chest pain preceded by a URI, so already you know what's going to go on. Um, you examine him, uh, his venous pressure's normal, his heart rate's 90, he's got a three-component rub at the left sternal border. Okay, here's the electrocardiogram, which you're going to get, and I'll give you about five seconds to look at this very classic electrocardiogram. And then, um, by the way, do you know what you call two orthopods reading an ECG? Anybody know? 
Um, it's called a double blind study. <laughs> but let's go on. So with that ECG and with that examination, what would be the next step in management of this patient? So um, one of the fellows, the smartest fellow, yell out what you would do next. <laughs> and Dr. Block says calf, which of course is correct. <laughs> but I think the point of this is that um, when, when we present this at some of our major meetings, 95% of the cardiologists say you need an echocardiogram. And if you get an echocardiogram, you'll usually get this type of result where it's not going to help you one whit because you're going to see uh, that there is no pericardial effusion. But um, you need to understand that you don't need an echocardiogram to diagnose acute pericarditis. And most of the time, um, in acute pericarditis, it's going to be completely normal. And that doesn't necessarily rule out the fact that there's inflammation there. So at Mayo, it costs 800 bucks to get an echocardiogram. It's 800 bucks you've spent unnecessarily. And for acute pericarditis, you just need to use your clinical judgment. So just a few things. And, and you know, this is elementary, but as we start going into things, we're going to find out more and more about how this elementary diagnosis is mistreated. So acute pericarditis, inflammation of the pericardium, and usually due to a viral infection, and you diagnose it by your history and rub and the electrocardiogram. And that's really all that you need. You don't need anything more than that. The one laboratory test that I would tell you to get, especially on your boards, is a troponin. Because the troponin is used to risk stratify these patients. If your troponin is negative, you can go ahead and treat them as an outpatient. But if the troponin is elevated, it usually then means that you've got involvement of the myocardium as well as the pericardium. They're going to be at risk for some arrhythmias, and they can be at risk for developing more of a myocarditis. And those are the patients that should be hospitalized. But as far as all the other tests, um, you really don't need anything else if you have this classic electrocardiogram with diffuse ST elevation, kind of like a smile, and you look for that PR depression, which is very, very important. Now, people tend to get a whole lot of tests with acute pericarditis. And you don't really need to get the tests because the chances of an autoimmune disease in the absence of any other symptoms is very, very low. Viral titers are really of little use and very, very expensive. You get a PPD, HIV serology, only if there's a high level of suspicion. And the echo is really only needed if you have an elevated venous pressure, pulses paradoxus, if you suspect any type of hemodynamic compromise. So if you have a normal troponin and uh, no venous pressure elevation, you really don't need that echocardiogram. Now, here's where the kicker comes in. Young guy comes in, uh, and he's really, really in a lot of pain. He's bending over just like these people normally do, can't lay down, uh, can't take a deep breath, and want to know how you treat the patient. Um, again, anybody want to yell out? Fellow wise, Robert, pick somebody. Huh? Well, uh, what would you do to treat? Anybody? Colchicine. So colchicine's good, but actually colchicine doesn't really treat acute inflammation. Colchicine will, as we'll talk about later, will prevent recurrences. But if you use colchicine alone, you'll never get rid of the, the uh, inflammation. Um, other thoughts? Mm. Okay. So anti-inflammatory agents are the initial drugs of choice. And we'll go over why in just a minute. But r r really, the best one to use is this old-fashioned aspirin. And these guys in front, remember when you used to give enough aspirin to cause tinnitus and then back down a little bit? That's the dose of aspirin that you really need. It's high dosages, but you'll find out it's much more effective than our more expensive non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. And if they're young and they can tolerate it, go ahead and give them the higher doses of aspirin and check a salicylate level. Have it between 10 and 20, and you'll find out that this old-fashioned treatment, which we used to use for rheumatic heart disease, um, is the best thing for acute pericarditis, uh, really much more effective than the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. Now, 
the uh, meadow saffron from the ancient Georgian state Colchis is this flower right here. It was considered dangerously toxic back in the ancient days, and this is where colchicine came from. So colchicine's emerge, it actually is, is very effective because it inhibits the microtubules self-assembling the leukocytes, so the leukocytes can't, um, can't, can't be very active. It inhibits the chemotaxis and the phagocytosis and, and things like that. But like I said, it's not very good at the acute treatment of inflammation. But because the Italians have done a wonderful job of randomizing patients with colchicine, they find that it's very, very good at decreasing the recurrence rate of relapsing pericarditis. And all of their trials show that if you add colchicine to an anti-inflammatory agent, um, the chances of recurrence are going to be very, very low. In itself, will not treat acute inflammation, but with, an as with aspirin or with a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agent, it's going to be very, very effective. And you start with about 0.6 milligrams twice a day. Make sure you don't get your diarrhea, but uh, you keep that on for a period of time. Now, here's the problem that arises. And, and I don't know how many times you've seen something like this, but this is a major problem. So this young guy was treated with prednisone. Now, prednisone makes the ED physician or the primary care physician look wonderful because as soon as the guy takes a dose of prednisone, bam, that pain's gone and they feel great. But this is what happens with prednisone. Is we treated with prednisone for about a month, 40 milligram taper to 20 milligrams. And what happens then is as soon as that prednisone is tapered off, boom, the symptoms come back. And then what happens is you go back up on the prednisone because at that time nothing else will work in terms of treating the pericarditis. And any time you try to wean down to about 15 milligrams, 12 milligrams, boom, the pericarditis comes back. So this is um, a problem called chronic relapsing pericarditis that I'll go into just a minute, but it's from this initial treatment with prednisone. So for acute pericarditis, just remember that aspirin high dose is the best drug. You can use non-steroidals, use it for at least a month, then taper slowly, and you can e either watch the CRP or sedimentation rate, add colchicine, keep the colchicine up for about six months because that's going to prevent your recurrence. But you do not ever use steroids in a person with inflammatory pericarditis because of this relapsing pericarditis. And this is a problem. This relapsing pericarditis, how, how many ha have had a patient with it? Raise your hand if you've had, yeah. See, it's common. And, and what it does is it takes these healthy kids and makes them into cardiac cripples. They just can't go on. Their, their life is terrible and they're afraid whenever they do anything, they're gonna get this recurrent pericarditis. So it's multiple episodes, pericardial pain, high sedimentation rate. Like I said, it always comes when you start to taper the prednisone, get to about 15 milligrams, bam, it comes back again. So th th there's several ways to treat this. Um, number one is the colchicine, but number two is a very, very slow taper of the prednisone while on high dose salicylates or non-steroidals. And this is a very, very slow dose taper. It's going, it, you, you can rapidly taper to about 15 milligrams, but once you get to about 15 milligrams, you've got to go down by about one milligram per month one milligram per month. That means that it takes over a year to get them off. But with this type of medical therapy, you can maybe get about 50 to 60% of your patients off of prednisone. Um, but it takes a lot of patience, a lot of time, a lot of effort, and you've got to make this pact with the person that you might be able to get them off, but they have to have the patience to do that. If they cannot get off the prednisone, um, at Mayo, actually, we've been doing a lot of complete pericardiectomies. Now, it seems like a huge op invasive procedure for just something as simple as pericarditis, but these patients are debilitated. And by performing a complete pericardiectomy, if you have a surgeon who knows how to do a complete pericardiectomy, over 95% can be free of symptoms off their steroids. 
So it's kind of your back pocket treatment that you have, but remember it for some of these uh, young people whose life has been devastated. Now, what's come on recently is the anakinra, um, which is the interleukin uh, inhibitor, which people have been using for rheumatoid arthritis. And there was a recent um, couple articles in JAMA and other journals which show that if you give this, you can get them off their steroids and it will uh, prevent the relapsing pericarditis from coming back. The problem with this though, is that you probably then convert them to a chronic disease. And even though we've been using it, it's a shot that you have to give like once, twice a week. Um, and even though it's effective while they're getting the shot, um, it's been difficult to get the people off the anakinra. So there are some young, usually young women who just don't want to undergo the surgery who are willing to take this shot once or twice a week of the anakinra, but it's not a cure. And uh, they'll probably end up lifelong on this drug, but at least don't have the surgery. So again, um, simple disease, pericarditis, but if they turn into this chronic relapsing pericarditis, it's a major problem. Now, about acute pericarditis, I just want to show this one here that came in um, just a little while ago. A 55-year-old man, previously healthy, um, comes in with the same type of story. Three days of severe pleuritic pain, um, can't take a deep breath, has to sit up. You listen to him, he's got a pericardial rub. But there's a difference here. Anybody, anybody shout out the difference? between this and the young man. Yeah, so Dr. Block, right on. Um, this person would not have medical therapy because if you take a look at that electrocardiogram, um, this is not up coving. This is the down coving ST segments that actually can be quite mistaken for diffuse pericarditis. And this is injury. And what happens with some of these people is that they have complete occlusion of a distal vessel, causes a small transmural infarction, goes out and then causes secondary pericarditis. Um, but these are the patients that are actually at risk for rupture. So you have to watch them very, very carefully. And um, there, there, there were some articles about uh, 20 years ago about um, these ST segments that are kind of lateral, that are uh, localized right in the lateral wall. And in those cases, especially with a rub, you have to be very, very careful that they haven't had a small transmural infarction. And um, these are the patients that can go on and have a major problem. So beware of pericarditis in the setting of infarction, pending myocardial rupture, and um, th these are the patients that can tube it very, very quickly. So that's pericarditis. Kind of simple, but I think the thing to remember is that you don't need an echocardiogram um, you should get your troponin to risk stratify. You should treat with your non-steroidals, aspirin or colchicine, but don't use steroids. And if they're going to have that chronic relapsing disease, there's a couple options you can use, but the best one is probably very, very slow taper. And there's not a lot of doctors that have the patience to do a very, very slow taper. So next, let's turn to pericardial effusion. So Pericardial effusion is pretty easy, and you're going to have this on the boards. There's going to be two or three questions on the boards, and uh, in this case right here where um, you've just got this huge effusion and uh, cardiac tamponade, there's no doubt you know what to do. You get a needle in there as soon as possible, and you go ahead and treat it. And these patients are going to show you these type of pressures where you've got hypotension, pulses paradoxus elevated venous pressure, loss of wide descent, and on your echocardiogram, you'll have your RA collapse and RV collapse, so you just get that fluid out in any way possible. Now, the problem that we're facing, though, and this is becoming more and more prominent in our cath labs and in our electrophysiology labs, because we're getting more and more invasive, and we're causing more and more of these micro perforations, and these patients will start complaining of pain blood pressure might drop a little bit. You bring in the echocardiogram and you see a small effusion. There's no RA collapse. There's no RV collapse. This might be a tough one to try to tap. And the question is, is it causing any hemodynamic compromise? 
Um, so you can go ahead and you can look and there might be a little bit of a pulses there. No hypotension though, difficult to tap what to do. And I think what we're going to be talking, going into then is the fact that you need to look for subtle hemodynamic parameters that there is indeed pericardial restraint there. So the dilated IVC is what you want to look at and then go ahead and have your echocardiographer put a pulse wave sample volume at the level of the mitral valve. And if you see some of these respiratory variations, and we'll go over the etiology of the respiratory variations when we talk about constriction, that is subclinical tamponade, and those are the patients with the subtle Doppler findings that you want to go in and tap, because those are the patients that if you let go back to their room, you're going to get a call four or five hours later saying their blood pressure is going down and they're, gonna, they're, they're going into full tamponade. So when you see those small pericardial effusions, even though you don't see any RA or RV collapse, make sure you get some of these Doppler traces. And if you have these subtle Doppler findings, go ahead and go ahead and tap. Now, here, are you using uh, echo-directed pericardial synthesis for the most part? Yeah, that's perfect. There's, I, I'm still amazed that around the country, about 60 to 70 percent of cath labs and EP labs are still going with that old sub-xiphoid approach um, with uh, fluoro, but um, the safest is to go ahead and localize uh, the area of the effusion with your echo, uh, find the angle and the position at which there's the largest amount of fusion, and go ahead and get your small catheter in place. And always use your echo because once you withdraw, go ahead and inject some agitated saline in, make sure you're in the pericardium and not in the right ventricle, which can happen. And that'll then allow you to put your five or six French pigtail in and do your continued drainage. It turns out that if you do an echo directed pericardial synthesis, almost 80% uh, of the time you're gonna go from the apical position as opposed to the sub xiphoid or parasternal position that you had before. And the complication rate goes markedly down when you use the echo directed. So we talked about acute pericarditis, pretty simple. We talked about pericardial effusion, pretty simple. This is the difficult part of pericardial disease. The diagnostic challenge, this could be a 72-year-old man who presents with weight loss and edema and he looks like he has cancer and comes in for a cancer workup. This could be the 52-year-old runner who looks healthy but has just lost steam. Instead of the eight-minute miles, he now has to do the 10-minute miles or the 12-minute miles, um, but has pericardial disease. It could be the 66-year-old woman with severe shortness of breath following aortic valve replacement 10 months ago. Um, this all can be constrictive pericarditis. Um, multiple presentations, multiple mimics of other diseases. I just had three patients come in the past month that came through our liver service because their initial diagnosis was cirrhosis and turned out to have constrictive pericarditis. So we need to talk about constrictive pericarditis because it is misdiagnosed, it is underdiagnosed. It's right heart failure out of proportion to left-sided disease. And it's important, it's incredibly important to diagnose because it's really one of our only treatable causes of heart failure. Now, early diagnosis and treatment is critical. Now, I, I remember back about 30 years ago, we would only go in on constricted pericarditis if they had class four symptoms, severe ascites and edema. But what we're finding now is that if we can go in earlier on these patients, um, there are operative risk is better, and their long-term outcome is better. Um, at Mayo, our operative risk if a patient comes in with elevated venous pressure before they have heart failure is less than one to two percent. But if we wait until they have liver failure and wait till they have kidney failure, it can be 50 to 60 percent. Long-term outcome is significantly impaired once they start to have the end stages of liver and kidney disease. So let's go through how we're gonna make the diagnosis here. And, and this is where the boards are, are really gonna hit hard because there's, uh, let's say in the past 20 years, I've counted about 750 articles, manuscripts, 
talking about how you diagnose contrictor pericarditis. Um, and, and what I'd like to do is, from a clinical perspective, put it all together on what you can count on, what is helpful, and what is not helpful in this diagnosis. Now, another major problem that comes to us in 2018 is we don't have classic constrictive pericarditis anymore. We have this type of a patient, this 44-year-old woman who comes in with previous radiation therapy for Hodgkin's disease or breast cancer. She's been cured from her malignancy, but now she presents with significant heart failure. And when they come in, the first thing you look at are their neck veins. Their neck veins are elevated with rapid wide descents, no murmurs or rubs audible, and they have this type of an echocardiogram. Now, as we'll go through this, what you should be able to do is look at this echo and say there's no doubt this patient has constrictive pericarditis. And it has nothing to do with the pericardium because I would never call abnormal pericardium on echocardiography. I think there's too many false negatives and false positives. But for those echo people in the audience, you can look at this, and there's no doubt that this patient has constrictive pericarditis that will go through. Now, here we, we talked yesterday about this is the proper way to do the four-chamber view with the left ventricle on the left. Um, but I did label it for you so you can see where the left ventricle is. But again, this is classic for constrictive pericarditis. You know, the echo report might come back as normal left ventricular size and function, normal valves, no pericardial effusion, but there's something that should catch your eye here that tells you for sure this is constricted pericarditis. Here's your short axis view, which again shows the same thing for the diagnosis of constricted pericarditis. Now, our mitral inflows are helpful, and you should always try to do long segments of your mitral inflow to help you, and we'll talk about why in just a minute. But seeing all of this, hearing what the clinical story is, knowing what the clinical examination is, and being able to see what you see on echocardiography, the question is, is how reliable are things, and do you need an MRI scan? Are you going to need a cardiac catheterization? Or can you go right to surgery with these patients? And that's what I want to go over in just a few, over the next few minutes. Now, scanning with CT or MR is somewhat useful. I mean, you can look at the pericardium very well. And you can see, in fact, that the pericardium is thickened. But I think what we need to understand is that patients who have proven constrictive pericarditis, especially those who've had radiation therapy or those after a previous operation, um, about 20 to 25 percent of them will have what's called a normal pericardium on CT or MRI scan. And then if you take another look at a group of patients, 70 percent of patients after radiation will have some degree of pericardial thickening. So it's neither specific nor sensitive an abnormal pericardium on imaging for the hemodynamic compromise of constricted pericarditis. So I, 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 what I want to point out to the fellows, it's useful, but you really need to look at the hemodynamics. Now, here's the cardiac catheterization that we would see. Um, and and um, a after this is over, we're going to sit down with the fellows and go over some of these complex hemos in more detail. But um, Peter and Spencer will remember, um, you know, the old criteria. And this was back in the one, 1970s, I think, that said that constrictive pericarditis will always have end equalization of pressures, and the left ventricular end diastolic pressure will equal the right ventricular end diastolic pressure. And this magic number from some of these studies said that the right ventricular diastolic pressure should be greater than a third of the right ventricular systolic pressure. And that is what you would be tested on with the boards. But if you take a look at these criteria, especially now that we're getting patients with myocardial restrictive disease versus constrictive pericarditis, if we look at those patients with constrictive pericarditis in the yellow dots and those patients with myocardial restrictive disease in the orange dots, and look at some of these old uh, criteria, such as the RVEDP over RVSP ratio, um, even though there might be a statistical 
difference between groups of patients in an individual patient the finding doesn't help one whit uh, if you look at the LVEDP minus the RVEDP, which was said to be a good criteria for differentiating constriction from restriction um, in an individual patient, it really doesn't help very much at all. So the problem now is as opposed to constricted pericarditis 30 or 40 years ago when it was mainly due to tuberculosis, so it was very, very classic, is we now have to differentiate constrictive pericarditis from restrictive cardiomyopathy, usually after radiation or prior open heart surgery, where they might have some constriction, some restriction, or a combination of both. So it becomes much more difficult. Now here's, here's kind of what, what I'd like to kind of, kind of put together for you. This picture here in the upper right, um, should be what all fellows should be able to recognize. You walk into a patient's room, uh, you look at their neck, the venous pressure is elevated, and you see this type of a thing. You see this rapid wide descent. If you have a patient who has that type of a physical examination, and then their body contour has kind of emaciated up on the top and um, ascites and edema on the bottom, and it's mainly right heart failure, and you see normal LV function and normal valves, there are some criteria that you can get on echocardiography that will clinch the diagnosis for you, and thus you do not have to go any further. But those criteria are this. It's this concept of a septal shutter, a septal shift, and a dilated IVC. And that's what I wanted you to see on that echocardiogram that I had shown you, because in the proper clinical setting, those echo findings are diagnostic. Now, take a look at this septum right here. You see how this septum is doing two things. Number one is during diastole, it's bouncing. So it, it contracts and then bounces. And every beat, it bounces, it bounces, it bounces. And then with inspiration, what you see is it shifts from the right ventricle to the left ventricle. So there's two things here. There's the septal bounce, the septal bounce, and with inspiration, it shifts from right ventricle to left ventricle. Now, if you look at this bounce, you can actually see this on M mode. And what I've got is some hi-fi catheters in right ventricle and left ventricle. And this is kind of neat here because um, it shows why you have that septal bounce. Is what is happening is that in constrictive pericarditis, blood rapidly goes into the right ventricle. Right ventricular diastolic pressure rises rapidly, rises much more rapidly than left ventricular diastolic pressure. So you've got that septal bounce where the septum shifts from RV to LV. And then LV takes over, so it shifts back into RV. And those arrows show what you see on M mode as that bounce. And if you see it on 2D, it's pretty diagnostic. And this is the mechanism of the septal bounce. So if you see this septal bounce or septal shutter and the septal shift and a dilated IVC on echo in the presence of um, a clinical presentation of constricted pericarditis, you just need to confirm it with some hemodynamic information. You have your diagnosis. Now, the old hemodynamics were static. It was this market elevation, early diastolic filling, and the equalization of pressures. But now what we're looking at are dynamic changes, hemodynamic changes. And there's two that I want you to concentrate on. One is the dissociation between intrathoracic and intracardiac pressures. And number two is enhancement of ventricular interaction. And those two things will be able to tell you whether constriction is there. Now, the dissociation of intrathoracic and intracardiac pressures, just think about this, is that if a person with a normal pericardium or myocardial disease inspires, their intrathoracic pressure drops. And as their intrathoracic pressure drops, the pressure inside the ventricle drops. So the driving pressure from the lungs to the heart doesn't change during the respiratory cycle. Now, if you take a patient with constrictive pericarditis, you've got this big rind around the heart. And this rind around the heart means that when a person inspires, the intrathoracic pressure drops, 
but the pressure inside the left ventricle stays pretty stable. So the driving pressure from the lungs to the heart decreases during inspiration. And that's what we call this dissociation. And if you take a look at a wedge and left ventricular pressure, and you look at this initial driving pressure between the wedge and left ventricle during inspiration and expiration, I've circled there, there's no significant change. But if you look at this patient with constrictive pericarditis, in which the intrathoracic pressure is dropping, but it's not dropping in the left ventricle, take a look at what's happening to that driving pressure, that initial gradient between the wedge and the left ventricle during inspiration, very, very tiny, and expiration, very, very large. Now remember that non-invasively, we can take a pulsed wave sample volume and put it at the mitral valve, and look at that pressure, that driving pressure between the lungs and the heart. So if we look at the transmitral flow curve, you see the fourth beat there, the E velocity markedly shrinks because that driving pressure is going down during inspiration and goes up during expiration. Peter. Oh, yeah, so, so that's, so you have actually a gradient between pulmonary vein, left atrium, and left ventricle. The pulmonary vein to left ventricle is the marked one, but you still see a gradient between left atrium and left ventricle. So there are changes, it, it, we've done it with transeptals, you still see those changes, which is reflected in the transmitral, but, not, but not as marked as you do with the wedge. That, that's a very, very good point because you do have that gradient there. But this is, this is really neat stuff, I think, it be, because it really puts things together and, and helps you make these diagnoses. So the point is, is this, is that if you have a person um, who's got a classic history, a classic examination, and you always have to put it together with your examination, you, you can't diagnose constriction unless you see those elevated neck veins. But those elevated neck veins are telling you that the right atrial pressure is very high, and you've got a rapid wide descent. And you see the septal bounce, you see the changes in the mitral flow, um, you can send the patient right to surgery. And we've trained our surgeons. Now, I know it's sometimes it's difficult to train surgeons, but we've trained our surgeons now to take these patients to pericardiectomy without a cardiac catheterization, without an MRI scan, without a CT scan. We'll do the cath to get look at the coronaries, but we will not need a cath for hemodynamics if everything fits together. Now, there's equivocal findings um, about 20 to 25, 25 to 30% of the time. So you've, you've got this straightforward stuff maybe two thirds of the time, but about a quarter of the time or a third of the time, you're gonna have equivocal findings. Now there's other Doppler findings that are helpful here, and this is the, you know, for the echo people, especially taking your boards, it's the expiratory reversals in your hepatic vein and the high DTI of the mitral annulus. But quite honestly, even though you've got articles and articles written about it, it's helpful, but it's not a game changer. That's, that in itself is not going to tell you that, yes, go ahead and do your pericardiectomy or don't do your pericardiectomy. We need to find the most, re in those cases in which not everything matches, we need to find the most reliable factor to say, yes, go ahead and do the pericardiectomy. Now, the hemodynamics, remember, we talked about as two things, and we talked about the dissociation between intrathoracic and intracardiac pressures, number one. But the other thing there is this enhancement of ventricular interaction. An enhancement of ventricular interaction means this, is you've got this rigid pericardium around the heart. It means that as less blood goes into the left ventricle during inspiration, more blood is going to go into the right ventricle because it's all contained in one sac. So with inspiration, you're gonna get a shift of the septum from right ventricle to left ventricle. The preload of the left ventricle is gonna be down and the preload of the right ventricle is going to be up. And in order to see that, that's where we go to the cardiac catheterization laboratory. Now, in the cath lab, you have to see at least one 
of two factors. You have to see either elevation and then equalization of diastolic pressures or a low cardiac output. If you have normal filling pressures and a normal output, no matter what else is going on, they don't have clinically significant constrictive pericarditis. So you have to see that. And if you see, let's say, a low filling pressure and a low cardiac output, that's where you have to give them fluids because they might be overdiuresed and masking things. It's necessary to see that, but you see this in restrictive myocardial disease. It's not diagnostic, but if you don't see it, you can rule out constriction. Now the way to reliably rule in constriction then is to look at the right ventricle and left ventricle during inspiration and expiration, keeping in mind that in constrictive pericarditis, you have an enhancement of ventricular interaction. And I've got two patients up here, both of whom who have severe right heart failure, both of whom who have early rapid filling, elevation, and end equalization of pressures, yet one is diagnostic for constriction and one is diagnostic for restriction. And if you take a look, what you, all you have to do is look at the area underneath the right ventricular curve and the area underneath the left ventricular curve because that's going to tell you what the preload of the ventricle is. In this case here, what is happening during inspiration is the right ventricular preload is going up, the left ventricular preload is going down as reflected by the yellow going down and the orange going up and this is constrictive pericarditis. If you look at this other one here, even though it ostensibly looked the same, with inspiration, both left ventricle and right ventricle goes down, which is pretty normal as the intrathoracic pressure drops. And this is myocardial restrictive disease, not constrictive pericarditis. And when we actually looked at the ratio of the LVRV areas between constrictive pericarditis and restrictive cardiomyopathy, we found a very, very nice correlation there, very, very nice cutoffs. And um, I would say on the basis of this that if you have any doubt, you go to the cath lab and enhanced ventricular interaction is probably the most sensitive and specific finding for constrictive pericarditis. So with the hundreds and hundreds of articles giving you all of these different criteria, from a clinical perspective, I would say this, is that if you have a 2D, and, and this takes a really trained eye, look for that dilated IVC, first of all, that tells you the right atrial pressure is elevated, and look for that septal shift and septal shutter. And if you see that, that's diagnostic. Now all of our Doppler stuff, our mitral valve inflow, our DTI, our hepatic vein, they're helpful, but they're not diagnostic. There's false positives, false negatives that can occur with each one of those. If you take them to the cath lab, that end equalization and low cardiac output is necessary, but not diagnostic. But the LV and RV discordance is diagnostic. And if you put all of this together, I think that you can then reliably tell which patient has constriction and which patient doesn't. Now, for STAM, I wanted to add some MRI scan because I think it is useful. Um, you can actually see that septal bounce. Take a look at that septum. You see how it bounces there? And if you're doing your MRI in real time and you see that bounce, you can diagnose constrictive pericarditis and I don't know if this will play, but by looking at the uh, real time um, with uh, inspiration, you can actually see that shift of the septum going from RV to LV. But I think probably the most important thing that MRI might help you with is if, if, you, if you have a patient whose constrictive pericarditis has come on rather acutely, let's say um, six months after valve surgery or um, comes on and the, and the patient's symptomatic only for about three months but comes in with very high neck veins, um, you get an MRI scan and you look at some GAD enhancement. And if you see gadolinium enhancement defects um, 
all around the pericardium, you know that there's active inflammation of the pericardium. And these patients probably have a inflammatory constrictive pericarditis that you could treat medically with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents and their constriction will actually go away. So if you've got any suspicion that um, you know the history is, is much more rapid than you think, that's where our MRI scans come in very, very nicely. And if there's some GAD enhancement all around the, in the pericardium, you can treat that. Now, I said treat with steroids. And remember, this is not a person who's got inflammatory severe pain, but this is a patient who's got inflammation that's gonna go to surgery. And steroids, I think, would be a very, very um, adequate thing to be able to treat that. So pericardial disease, simple problem, misdiagnosed, undertreated. Uh, remember about the inflammation, remember about the uh, fluid, and then remember about the diagnostic challenge that we have with constrictive pericarditis. Now, I, I've got, uh, I got time to present kind of a case here, and I don't know if you want to break now and have it for questions or go through this case. What do you think, Robert? Okay. I like this case. This is an important case, um, and it'll get you thinking in the morning. Now, uh, it's a prominent physician who came from an academic center. I won't tell you where, um, but um, he came to us for his fifth opinion. It tells you kind of what he's been through. It's going to be a complicated history. I'll just go through it very quickly. He had bradycardia, had a permanent pacemaker, and then he had severe chest pain at a medical meeting, had an emergency angio at a um, uh, academic center, and had the diagnosis of acute pericarditis because the angio didn't show any significant <laughs> coronary disease. Seven years ago, he had recurrent pericarditis, was treated with colchicine. Okay, so that's kind of his past history. Now, the last two years, he's had progressive shortness of breath and edema, requiring increasing diuretics, He's now on 120 of Lasix twice a day. You examine the guy, his venous pressure is very elevated with a large V wave. He's got a one plus parasternal lift. He has a barely audible whole systolic murmur. He's got early diastolic filling sound and he's got pitting edema. He's got severe um, edema and ascites. And here's his echocardiogram with the left ventricle on the proper side. And I'll just show you that he doesn't have a lot of mitral disease. I'll show you that his DTI here is um, kind of borderline. Doesn't help like most DTIs. Um, he's got some tricuspid regurgitation here. Important thing about that tricuspid regurgitation is that the peak velocity is uh, only about um, maybe 2.5 eight, so he doesn't have severe pulmonary hypertension. But here's a guy who's had previous pericarditis, who has severe, severe right heart failure, intractable, been through multiple, multiple institutions, and nobody can make the diagnosis. Um, our echocardiogram report, ejection fraction 71%, mild right ventricular enlargement, mild AR, moderate, mild to moderate MR, moderate TR, estimated right ventricular pressure, 50, indeterminate diastolic function, doesn't really help. I'm gonna show you this. His CT scan shows mild patchy pericardial thickening, and we take him to the cath lab. Okay, so here, here's where you put on your thinking hat. We've got an RV LV up above. We've got a wedge LV down at the bottom. And we've got his history, and we got severe right heart failure. Now there's something very interesting about this RV and LV that actually clinches the diagnosis. But it, it takes some thought because it took a while for us to put this all together. Any, any thoughts about this? So you've got elevation of, I mean, this is, this is going to about 20 here. So end diastolic pressure is about tw maybe 25. There's equalization. 
But I think the funny thing is here. Take a look at this. RV, yeah. So, so Dr. Block is saying, boy, this R, look how this RV comes up and exceeds the LV much greater than you would expect. Now, with that history, is there anything that clicks in your mind? That we, we're ha, perfect. Whenever a person has, e and, and 15 years ago, I went to our, our pacemaker people, and I said, you know, you're causing TR. And they said, no, it never happens. Now, lead-induced tricuspid regurgitation is probably one of the most common causes of surgical treatment of, of, of TR requiring surgery. And if you have a person and, uh, you, you know, you the history of pacemaker going in, big B waves. And if you notice from the fellow's standpoint, when I talked about the neck veins being up, I didn't talk about a rapid descent. I talked about a V wave. And even though it's subtle, a rapid descent has a venous pressure up here and goes like this. That's, that's what I'd shown you in that one picture. A V wave goes up like this. There's a difference, but the difference is subtle, but the difference makes your diagnosis. And, um, you know, this was back, this was one of our first ones that uh, we needed to prove. So we did this old fashioned ventriculogram of the right ventricle, and you just see wide open tricuspid regurgitation. And we first reported this um, about 10 years ago, and since then, um, it's really gained a lot of attention. And um, there's a lot of review articles now uh, talking about lead induced tricuspid regurgitation. And um, the, tri the, the lead can either perforate through the tricuspid valve, it can entangle in the cordi and interfere with the coaptation, or it can displace the leaflet. And if these patients are not treated, they're only going to have progressive right heart dilatation, progressive tricuspid regurgitation, progressive more right heart dilatation, annular dilatation, tricuspid regurgitation. It's TR begets, TR begets, TR begets and they're gonna just go into severe right heart failure. Whereas if you catch this, if you can make your diagnosis, you go ahead and you do your surgery and they're gonna be much, much better. But the clue here was exactly what Dr. Block picked out is that we're not necessarily gonna look at systole in the traces, we're gonna look at diastole. And if you see that that RV diastolic pressure is rising much above the LV diastolic pressure, there's something going on with the RV and it's either severe RV dysfunction or a big volume load into the right ventricle from severe tricuspid regurgitation. And if you look at that diastolic LVRV, you'll see that as compared to true constrictive pericarditis when the LV and RV are supposed to stay together. So severe TR increasing incidence simulates constrictive pericarditis. I would say that um, probably about a third of the patients that are referred to me for constrictive pericarditis will have something like this instead, which is a completely different operation. And you'll be able to make your diagnosis from subtle changes in diastolic pressure. So I just wanted to put that in because not everything coming in with severe right heart failure is constriction. And we're seeing more and more of that, um, not only with the leads, but with atrial fibrillation. And tricuspid regurgitation, I think, is going to become the next valve disease that we really have to think about. So pericardial disease, a simple problem. Well, it seems like it, but remember, it is one of the most misdiagnosed and undertreated problems we have in adult cardiac disease today. And I hope we've gone through and talked about the inflammation, the fluid, and the constriction so that you can apply this to the next patient you see in your clinic. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, that was fantastic, and uh, we have time for a few questions if people have some questions. Spencer, we'll start with you. Uh, and we'll have to re uh, let's see the microphone here. Now. As you know, that's what I say in my sleep is use the microphone. I think you have to even turn it on. We're back here in the older world. There we uh, go. Nish, uh, so you talked about pericarditis and, and, and sort of related to the young patient. I, the only case I've treated lately was my sister, okay? She's 77, 
and she's uh, in Chicago, and she gets, uh, you know, some symptoms that sound to me kind of like it could, could be pericarditis, and she goes in and she gets seen by several people. Uh, you talk about, okay, the EKG was not classic. Uh, everybody gets an echo, whether they need it or not, as you know. So she gets an echo. She's got a centimeter of, of a fusion, and um, eventually we treat her correctly with aspirin and, and, and colchicine. But uh, she has a pretty, you know, work, big workup for autoimmune and everything else. Uh, what do you, age-wise, I mean, you see pericarditis occurring in a 77-year-old. Do you, do you take this kind of approach you would take in, in a kid uh, or, or not? You know, that, that's, that, that's a very interesting question because uh, it is unusual in, in, in the older people. Um, and I, I, I would be kind of concerned more about malignancy uh, in that type of situation if it recurs and stuff. But as, you, as we think about, you know, you know, all of the big trials of the pericarditis, they're all in younger people. So I think that's a great point, Spencer. Yeah. That's what I worried about. Fortunately, uh, it's been a long time, hasn't recurred. And, that's good. And, yeah, and the uh, follow-up so, is yeah. important. Spencer, I want to thank you for the HIPAA violation. <laughs> <laughs> Rick, can I just make a comment? Your, your cross-section of the heart with constrictive pericarditis uh, reminded me about the surgical issues that constriction actually produces for a surgeon if you, and the whole point of getting to surgery early because one of the things that we forget as non-invasive surgeons is that when the surgeon gets in there after someone's had chronic pericarditis and constriction for a long time, fibrosis extends down into the myocardium. Yeah. And that's why patients who have chronic pericarditis and you don't get to them until late don't do well after their surgery because their myocardia are filled with yeah. this fibrotic grump which the surgeon can't get out. Yeah. And so the clinical point is to get there early and then refer them early so that they can get the pericardium off. Yeah, absolutely. Would you agree with that? I, I agree. I, that That's why that mortality is so high. I mean, right. They'll be sitting there for 12 hours picking exactly. that little calcium yeah. ridges going in and stuff. So, that, yeah, you're right. Early is, is better. You had mentioned in the setting of uh, pre, pre tamponade physiology to use some of your echo clues. Right. Um, I guess I'm going to ask you to comment on the hemodynamic, you know, <coughs> physical exam clues that you, because often there are, there's these subtle echo clues. Uh, but the patient's not hypotensive, tachycardic, uh, symptomatic at that point. And then you talked about early um, pericardiocentesis, but with the etiology of uh, pericardial tamponade now transitioning more to malignant disease and, and chronic diseases, uh, can you comment on just asking our surgeons to put in a window uh, and as opposed to tapping, uh, which might be at least I guess a temporary treatment, but not a, a permanent treatment in some of those cases. Yeah, so, so we always, you, you know, we've got these experts who've done like thousands of echo taps, so they could get at anything. And so, so we're privileged to be able to do that. But our, 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 the way that we do things, we always tap first. Um, we always send cells away. Um, we always look and see if it's bloody or not before uh, considering any type of, su of surgical approach. The only time we would do surgery is post-op if they've got a big hematoma posteriorly, let's say, that they, they could, couldn't get to. So, so at Mayo, we very rarely do a win. We, we really haven't done windows for, for a long period of time. Fellows, the clinical clues of, of tachycardia at rest or hypotension and, and a pulses, as opposed to using those those echo, you know, I yeah. guess hints. Is, does one supersede another for you in terms of making no, that I th decision? No, I think it's all incredibly important, and the tachycardia and the way the patient looks is, is incredibly important. One thing I'm going to test the fellows on here is both of these patients. Um, have an elevated right atrial pressure. One of them needs a needle, the other needs cold steel. And you'll need to tell me when we get together which is which. And it's a classic board question. Yeah, 
Um, with respect to the septal shutter that you mentioned on echo, yeah. are there any um, things to take into consideration if a patient's post-surgical and has had a prior uh, pericardectomy at the, or partial at the, with the surgery? Yeah, so, so you will have abnormal septal motion for about six months after surgery. But the abnormal septal motion, if you actually use your M-mode, is during systole. So, so the septal shutter that you see is early diastole, and that's why the M-mode is so important, because it really is, is nice to have that temporal resolution there. Same with the left bundle, too. Okay, well, with that, we'll, we'll thank you again for a fantastic talk. And uh, the fellows are getting together here, or where? 10 o'clock on the sixth floor. Kurt, that's open to anybody, any of our residents, fellows, or faculty? Welcome. 9 o'clock, sorry. Yeah. Head on up there. We'll look forward to it. All right, thanks so much. That's great. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.